Hello. Last week we left David and he was in second place on his way to first place. Well, today we're going to see the steps that you take to find not just first place, but God's best for your life. David went to Hebron where he was anointed king of Judah. However, king of Judah was not God's plan or destiny, so it only ended up being second best because he was called to be the king of Judah. Years went by while he was there as the king of Judah, but while he was there, he put into practice and developed character and work habits for Zion, for God's best for him. Then, one of the things that he did seven and a half years later was to graciously accept the promotion to be king of Israel when it was offered to him. Ishabeth, that worthless but only surviving son of King Saul, had been appointed by commander in chief Abner to be king of Israel. Ishabeth died. There was no other candidate to be king, so then all the leaders who had fought against David had tried to kill him, had tried to destroy his army and his kingdom, came and asked him to be king. Now, what would you do? These men have been ignoring you, fighting against you for seven and a half years. I mean, you have a comfortable place. You have a place of leadership, and the Bible tells us that Israel, where these leaders are from, that it's getting weaker and weaker, but your kingdom, Judah, is getting stronger and stronger. What would you do? Would you leave that secure place that you had? Would you risk losing the followers that have surrounded you and been loyal to you to take what looks like a failing fallen nation? David did. He considered that and knew that this was God's best for him. And so he took the title, but the title only put him in a position to take the throne. All of his training, all of his qualifications, and even the fact that he was ready to go was not essential enough for him to secure his destiny. There were still steps to God's best for him and steps that he had to take to reach his destiny in Zion. So what are these steps that David took? Well, the first thing he did was that he put himself in the place that God had called him. You know, he wanted to enter God's place of destiny as king of Israel, but he certainly could not do it from Judah. And so he went to Jerusalem this was not just a ge geographic location for David. It was also a spiritual location. Second Samuel 5, 6 says, The king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who spoke to David, saying, Oh, you shall not come in here, but the lame and the blind will repel you. They were thinking, David cannot come here. You see, David changed his environment in order to stay focused on his goal. He wanted to be God-focused. And this was going to prevent him from wasting his time and his energy and everything else on trivial matters that didn't amount to anything. And in order to stay destiny-focused, he had to do that. He was sort of like Nehemiah another guy in the Old Testament who was sent years and <clears throat> years later to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. And while Nehemiah was there, three guys kept asking him, oh, Nehemiah, come down and talk to us. Nehemiah, come and do this. What they were really trying to do was to divert Nehemiah from his destiny and stop the work. But Nehemiah says, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down why should I leave the work while I come down to you? Nehemiah and David both knew their destiny, and they would not stoop to anything less than that. And only those who have truly glimpsed their destiny can really attain God's best. See, Jerusalem was a great choice for the capital, and it was one that... 
David knew he had to secure. Not only was it elevated and protected on three sides from deep valleys, it was easy to defend, but there was no other tribal association with this place. This had always belonged to the Jebusites, the Canaanites, and never belonged to any of the tribes of Israel. But, you know, when he got there, there's the problem. Jerusalem was occupied. And it did not look like what he thought his destiny would look like. He thought, oh, I finally made it to be king. I know that God's called me. Everything ought to be just fine now. That's the way it is sometimes with us in our destiny. God calls us to a place. We get everything ready. We move there. And <laughs> what have you called me to, God? This, I was better off staying there. And not only that, the inhabitants, they, they all mocked him. They said, huh, the lame and the blind, they can come in here easier than this. See, they felt very, very secure with the deep valleys around Jerusalem. One of them was actually called the Valley of Death. And if you're familiar with Psalms 23, verse 4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And it talks about God being with him. He knew what he was writing about because of the massive valley around Jerusalem. And if one were to go out walking in that valley with all of its crooks and crannies and everything, the only way that they could find their way out was with a shepherd. And so David knew that this was what it was. But there is a fact. Our destiny may not look like what we think it should, but the truth is it will look like that after we occupy it. Because you see, anything in worthwhile that's in our kingdom we have to fight for and take out of enemy hands yes salvation is free but everything else our health god's prosperity all the promises of god they are things that belong to us but we've got to move in and take out of the enemy's hand so what was the second step that david did well he did not argue with the enemy he just moved in and took what was his. Verses 7 and 8 of chapter 5 says, Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, that is the city of David. Now David said on that day, Whoever climbs up by the way of the waterfall and defeats the Jebusites, he shall be my chief and captain. You see, first thing David did was he spoke to the men. He spoke to his followers. He spoke to his army. He did not waste time speaking to the enemy. You know, a lot of times we waste our time arguing with the devil. But we need to remember from Ephesians 6, 10 through 13 that the enemies are not people. It says we do not argue or wrestle, fight against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. These are are the demonic powers that try to build a wall around our dream and keep us from reaching the destiny that God has planned for us. And so, just like David, we've got to make our own decision that we are not going to argue or even try to reason with the demonic forces, but just take back what they stole from us. And what did they steal? Oh, they try to steal our destiny, our birthright, our inheritance. Jerem, Jerusalem had been part of God's plan before David came on the scene, and it would continue to be God's plan even after the time of David. You see, Jerusalem, Mount Moriah, that's where God chose Abraham to go and make preparations to offer a sacrifice of his son Isaac. Jerusalem, that's the spot where Solomon built the temple, built the house of the Lord that David had instructed him to build. 
Psalms 132.13 says, For the Lord has chosen Zion, and he has desired it for his dwelling place. There's something special about Jerusalem. It tells us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We are commanded over and over and over to pray, to pray for Jerusalem and to know that God loves them. And so this was a special place to God, and he wanted David there for his destiny. And so the second thing that David did was he took the stronghold of Zion. This was his inheritance, and this was his destiny. God had given it to David. He had already made preparations for David, and he knew where he wanted David to be. But the thing is, David had to go in and actually take possession of it. You were born to take God's best. You were born to walk in all of his best and walk in your destiny. But you must take possession of what God's given you. We not only go to where his calling is like David did, but once we get there, we have to take our birthright. We have to walk, take our inheritance and walk in everything that he's given us. So David took it. He said, this place is mine. But he did more than that. He lived in his place of destiny, and he called it his. You see, he, he could have just told the Jebusites, okay, write me out the deed. This is my property now, and gone back and lived in Judah. But no, he actually moved there, and this was his. At verse 9 of chapter 5, the first part of it says, Then David dwelt in the stronghold and called it the city of David. He dwelt there in that fort. And this means, that word dwelt means, it means that he established his seat of authority or his position. He, he became comfortable in Zion. It's like Psalms 133, 1 says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And what that means is that each one will find a proper seat of authority and each person will discover who he is. That's what happens in the local church. That's why we come together in, as a body of believers. Yes, talking with you online is really great. But you know what would be better? To see you in person and for us to get together and for me to share my gifts with you in person, but more than that, for you to share your gifts with me, to recognize who God has called you to be and then for you to walk in the place that God's called you to be. He wants you to give out of what he has given you. He wants you to take what's yours and then turn around and give it back out as a blessing to other people. See, David was in his place. He was established. He sat there. He ruled there. He was inside the fort. He became adjusted to it. He was at home. He knew who he was in that place. He established that strong tower, that strong base of support. And he called the city, well, it's called by three names, even in these few verses here. It's called Jerusalem. It's called Zion. Now, this is the first time in the Bible, in these verses, that we see the name Zion listed. But do you realize that after this, the, it's mentioned as Zion another 152 times? Uh, and then he called it the city of David. Now, what's the significance of calling it by name. Well, the word call is kara in Hebrew, and it means to appoint, to call into place, and to establish something by the words of our mouth. God gave us an example of this by doing it himself. In Genesis, in creation, chapter 1, verses 5, 8, and 10, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. God called the firmament heaven, and God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. It was so important 
And so David called it the city of David. And what he was doing there when he called it by his name, he said, this is my city. He says, I am responsible for what happens here. I have been anointed and appointed to be here by God. And so I'm settled here. No, I don't have plans to move. I'm not going to get an eviction notice from the enemy. I'm settled here because I know that God has called me here, anointed me to be here, and I'm responsible for what happens here. Well, knowing that, what was the next step he did? He restructured his priorities around his destiny. It said in verse 9, the second part of that verse says, and David built all around from Milo and inward. Now that word Milo, it really means a citadel. It's a planning room for generals where they draw out, and make their plans for attack. It became the center of David's destiny. And so he built all around this from around it and inward. And it's, it's sort of like the spokes on a wheel you know you, you've got the center of the wheel and you've got all these spokes that go out in all different directions and so think of it as being an, an, when a new owner moves into the house the first thing they do is they go inside and paint the walls redo the carpet move the furniture put up new drapes whatever bring their furniture in I'll hang some pictures. You see, the house must change from the inside in order to reflect that new owner because our most important things happen on the inside. A famous quote from Whistler was when someone went to buy one of his paintings. He said, build a gallery for the art don't buy art for a gallery. He says, what you're taking into it is more important than anything that could be around it. And David realized that. He built his life around his destiny and knowing that he could not ever build his life around a schedule, around interest, around any other thing that might be part of the details of life. He said, this is my destiny, and everything I do will reflect it. And finally, you know, he's there. So what other steps can he take? He has the throne. He, he has, he's in this place of destiny. He knows where he is. So what do you do now? It seems like it would be simple just to say, okay, he's finished. Let's stop. No. Verse 10 tells us, and David went on and he became great and the Lord God of hosts was with him. You see, David had the throne, but he was not reigning yet. Learning is a lifetime experience. And so David had an ongoing task. It says that he went on, he pursued, he marched forward so that this became a lifestyle for him. Living in his destiny was something that he always did. And even if he failed, or even when he failed, David always came back to that center point. He always came back to his destiny. He stayed focused. Famous saying is, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. That was a motto in David's life. He never forgot God. He never forgot who God had called him to be. And he never forgot to make that the center of his life. David grew great. And greatness is conformity to our destiny. And in this play, case, it's David's conformity to God's destiny, his divine destiny. Anything else is nothing but poverty force. It's, it's like a leash trying to sap something out of us. But why was he great? God's presence. The Lord God of hosts was with him. This was the only reason that David was great. As David grew great, God grew in him, by him, and through him. And God's presence is the only thing that will make any of us great. 
as we recognize what God wants to do in us, through us, and with us, and we follow the destiny that God has called for us, as we follow those steps, we will reach God's best for our life, and it's the only way that will happen.